I was very disappointed <laughs> with boggles the mind how some people treat you on the internet and not not just like you know trolls but i mean like people just you know their common sense goes out the window episode three of the shelvage podcast really excited that i made it this far i've tried the podcast route a few times in the past I made it as far as like episode one, and then I kind of fizzled out. So three episodes, definitely a win in my book. I've got some more exciting wins for the broader community, I think. We've got to talk about the name. Other than that, let's let's kind of get into what, what topics we're going to talk about here. So we've got the industry news as always. We'll be looking at the always popular shoegazing blog. We're going to get into reviewing and responding to your comments or reacting maybe. I missed that in episode two. I got preoccupied, overexcited, if you will, in reacting to the Stridewise video about the infamous Alden Indy. If you haven't checked out that episode, wait until you watch this one and then go check that one out. And then also sharing that uh, video that I just love from Welted Wear, Ashwin, a good friend. But back to the comments. We're going to react to the comments today and we'll wrap up with what I'm going to classify as like the impromptu rant of the week. For those of you that are on YouTube, listening on YouTube or watching on YouTube, really support that. Make sure to, uh, you know, subscribe to the channel, um, set up the notifications for the podcast. But for those that are listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, you can now do that. The name. So this is this is definitely an important topic here. I was going with the Shellcast, but apparently that's taken. As I was publishing on Apple Podcasts and I searched the Shellcast, other podcasts came up. They're about a uh, seashell or somebody that has a passion about the seashells. So uh, Shellcast may not work. I do like the Shelvage podcast. It's not that exciting, but it's very accurate <laughs> in describing what we're doing here. So let me know what you think. The Shelvage podcast, the Shellcast even though there's already one out there, or something else. Definitely want to make sure the name is something that's simple to the point. Obviously, that's what simple means, but you get it. Simple to the point. Descriptive of like what it is we're going to talk about. So if somebody sees the name, they get it. And yeah, I'd love to hear what you think. For those that are watching on YouTube, I'm going to jump over into the specific articles that we were talking about. The web tip, Kirby Allison videos of the world championship contest 2023 starts off with a beautiful picture of the patina contest now this is again from the super trunk show the the contest we talked about last week was was the world championship of shoemaking so this is at the same venue the same event but this is a different contest within that venue event circumstance of people now, there are individual videos within the series for the Shoe Shining World Championship, the Patina Contest, the Shoe Making Contest. And while I would love to uh, kind of walk through each of those, I guess I can. But let's uh, just turn this down a bit. I did have the opportunity to watch this video a little bit earlier, namely because uh, Alberto Suarez, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, Alberto, but he is one of the contestants here. There we go, Alberto. So Alberto and I kind of go, say like way back, essentially like him and I have been, um, you know, in this shoe community, or he's been in it as long as I have, as long as I can remember. He was in the, a lot of the Facebook groups Alan Edmonds, uh, Alden, Shell Cordovan, all that kind of stuff. Very nice guy. We've, uh, you know, been for this type of environment, this online community. I would say Alberto is as good of a friend as as any that I have, and uh, you know, really cool to see him. See him here. Unfortunately, he uh, he did not receive the first place championship. Uh, you can watch the rest of this video if, you know, if you would like, I'll put that in the show notes, but really cool. And I wanted to make sure to feature that, um, just as kind of recognize the, uh, 
the accomplishment that just making, you know, a contestant and an entry in in that contest is pretty pretty cool itself. Taking a quick look at the shoe shining one, you know, it's a very similar layout from Kirby. Um, he kind of goes through and introduces all of the shiners, and then uh, you know, there's some B-roll um, around them actually shining the shoes. Jesper, or Jesper, as you may say, um, you know, kind of gives some commentary, some color commentary. Um, and then ultimately fast forward here, I believe what happens is Kirby, um, kind of ruins the surprise in some of these by featuring the one interview that he, he publishes before it's announced. And essentially what that, what that does is it kind of gives away, uh, who won because he only published the interview of the winner, but needless, needless to, uh, uh, needless to all that, the jury is out here. You can see Justin, Jesper, and the rest of the roadies that will be supporting the uh, worldwide, um, you know, the the worldwide tour that all these winners are going on. And again, that's all in jest. Really respect and appreciate the fact that they're able to put something on like this. It's a huge deal for the community. But yeah, watch these videos. You know. Uh, it is what it is about like whether or not, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of, of Kirby's channel as it is today. I can tell you, you know, at one time I definitely was a huge fan of his channel and that's how I kind of grew up in the shoe community. And that's really, really where I learned a hundred percent of what I knew for the first two years. Uh, things may have gotten off course in my perspective, but these videos are back on course if you were to ask me. All right, let's let's get on to the next article here. Kind of pick up the pace, as as you may say. I don't know who may be saying that, but you know we'll we'll proceed. So let's take a look at the, this this picture of the business of footwear. Now now, I was very disappointed <laughs> with uh, essentially I was very disappointed with what this ended up being. I thought this was going to be an in-depth article talking about the business of a shoe store, the business of what a shoe store is today, and it was not. I was extremely let down, Jesper. You'll have to make that up to me. But the opportunity, the opportunity, if you ask me, is we can figure that out. We can write a podcast talking about what is the business of a footwear store today. If that's something that you would find as interesting as, as I think it would be, let me know. And we can work on that. We can connect with personalities, characters, such as the one and only shoe snob blog, Justin Fitzpatrick. We could talk to Matt Gray, otherwise known as the inventor of the double cross twist ankle Alden shell insta pose. It's just Matt Gray, you know, pretty uh, revolutionary Instagram account. And, you know, folks like that that run stores um, kind of understand like what was it like when they first started? What is it like today? Are there different dynamics? And uh, really kind of proceed, really kind of proceed from there. So uh, let me know. What your thoughts are on that topic would love to uh, kind of get something a little more robust. I was really hoping that was going to be something much more exciting. Clearly, it was not. So let's take a look at the uh, the next article here in depth. So this is this is probably what I should have been looking for with the business of footwear, not just uh, a picture, but in depth. How type of leather affect fit? If my uh, grammar is off there. I'm just reading verbatim as to what this says. The title is ha In Depth How Type of Leather Affect Fit. This article goes into, uh, dare I say it, the depths of the topic, in depth of the topic. And it really talks about the various aspects 
of how the fit can be impacted due to a, a number of factors when, let's say, all things created equal, the last, the shoemaker, the size, the pattern, all those things are the same, but the leather is different. So you have calfskin versus shell cordovan, suede versus shell cordovan, embossed calfskin versus smooth calfskin. Whenever the leather is different, you should and can reasonably expect the fit to vary. Now, Jesper goes into details about why. I'll save you some of the painstaking details, but essentially leather has different tensile strengths. Tensile strength is just how robust or how rigid the pore structure and the grain structure of the leather is. And because of that, you can either have the leather withstand more or less stretching over the last. Shell cordovan, a lower tensile strength, a more robust leather overall due to the tannage, but the lower tensile strength means that it's going to be lasted a little looser than a young calfskin. An embossed leather a tumbled leather, anything that kind of was smooth and then it's kind of been tanned in a way to artificially create texture will, will have a bit more stretch to it uh, or the potential for the bit more stretch as that, as that embossing or as that constricting that's done in the tannage can can sometimes kind of just reach back to, you know, not where it was prior, but kind of a, a middle ground between the two. Another example is like a full grain reverse suede versus a split suede. Full grain reverse suede is going to be on par with just a calfskin because you're just flipping that same leather inside out. When you split it, you're losing some of the tensile strength of the top layer of the leather. Also, this article goes into a lot of details about how there's other elements that could do the same. So you have the same leather, the same last, the same maker, but a different pattern, a hole cut versus a wing tip, a cap toe versus a hole cut. Whenever you add more pattern pieces that have to be sewn onto the upper, essentially you're going to be creating a, a tighter fitting shoe. The reason for that is when it's a single piece of leather, that tension is equally dispersed throughout the upper. And therefore, like it, it kind of has a, an equal ability to last it, put the right, ten, the right tension over the last and really kind of like feel for it as you're doing the hand lasting. When you have a wingtip or something that has multiple pattern pieces, multiple pieces of leather stitched on top of each other, that reduces the overall surface area of each piece of leather, reducing really like how much each piece of leather can be stretched before you start distorting the pattern that you've just created. This is an oversimplification of all of these factors, but 100% factually true and definitely a topic worth diving into. Next, we've got this article about Goodyear welded construction. I'll, I'll kind of breeze through this, but again, for, for those on YouTube or just, or just listening, I'll put all the links in the show notes or the description. This is talking about the origins of Goodyear welding and how, when it started, the Goodyear weld construction essentially was, was not using the canvas gemming or gemming. It's kind of like Jesper or Jesper, gemming or gemming. Let me know which one it is or which one you believe it is. But ultimately the breakdown here is like, you know, the, the origins of the Goodyear welding machine and the welting machine community included uh, a machine carved holdfast out of the leather insole. It was a thicker leather insole. Instead of gluing the canvas gemming on, what they would do is carve a leather 
version of that, which they call the holdfast, out of the bottom of the insole, and that's where the Goodyear welt stitch would be executed. There are some makers that do that, do that today. There's advantages, disadvantages, but the, the purpose of this article, and I'll separate out kind of the evolution, is basically like the canvas gemming or gemming. I'm going to alternate that. The canvas gemming was added as a way to reinforce the leather holdfast that was cut out by the machine because as you introduce more and more machine work, ultimately those machines could damage that leather holdfast. And if you do that, you've just damaged the structural integrity of the shoe. So they began to add this canvas gemming. Gemming this time, yep. So they would add that to reinforce the leather holdfast that was carved out. And uh, evolution, evolution, evolution. Now, today, it's just gluing the canvas, gemming. Gemming, 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 gemming. You know, this is one of the core difference, differentiators, excuse me, the core differentiators between hand and Goodyear welded as it is today. And why many prefer hand welded because when you're carving the leather holdfast from the leather insole, You've removed essentially the the where the failure point could happen with a welded shoe, and that is the glue could come undone. But when you're using the leather holdfast, which is which is part and parcel, it's it's one piece of the insole. It's all one one and the same. You know, it, it's not going to come unglued because it is not glued. It is just part of that leather. Another topic for another podcast, but. Really interesting evolution that I was actually not aware of. I, I knew that there were multiple ways of, of doing it. I didn't realize that it was definitively started like that. So we've still got the rant after this, but let's cover these comments real quick. So what we're going to start with is a comment on the video that I made about stretching shoes. Now, this video, just for context for those that are, you know, have, have not seen the video or are not on YouTube. This video was like, how do you provide like pinpoint, very targeted shoe stretching? And it went over like using skived leather, adding it on top of the last and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You, you adjust a one very tiny part of the shoe. I also outlined either in this video or another video, there's, there's essentially like three things. It's like a brute force method where you just shove the biggest thing in that you can find and hope that it stretches without breaking. God. The next is, uh, you know, more of a uh, middle road where you just take, you know, a uh, shoe tree that's already lasted for that last but is a slight, you know, like a half a size bigger. And you use that to be a, a very like mild overall stretch, not like two sizes bigger or not a generic shoe tree that's just going to misshape in the whole thing. But, you know, a half size bigger, same last shoe tree, very targeted all over gentle stretch. And then there's like my preferred method, which is reminiscent of what a bespoke or a made to measure, made to order shoemaker would do, which is where they're kind of having very targeted adjustments in very particular parts of the shoe to customize it to your foot. Let's go ahead and look at this comment. And we'll see what this member of the shelvage community had to say. So the comment here from Hemigod2, essentially, and for YouTube, you'll be able to see this on the on the, on the screen here. Um, I'm using elastic shoe tree type that has a spring strut joint and placing a stack of pennies as shims in between the joint and the tree and plenty of shell cordoman cream to lube the skin. I, I hope that he means the skin like the shell cordoban leather, not shell cordoban cream on the skin as lube. No judgments. I've just never heard conditioning leather referred to as lubing. So for those wishing to try my method, this is him speaking, I use a flat screwdriver to pry the joint open of the shoe tree while inserting it in the shoe, and then I squeeze the shim stacks in between the joint. So far, I'm up to 7 cents per shim stack, 
and the shoe shine like steel. All right, so let me let me kind of like cut to the chase here a bit. I've read this a few times already, trying to digest, absorb, not the not the lube, but just trying to absorb the information. So what I gather is he's basically taking a shoe tree, and for those that are watching on YouTube, a shoe tree that has a double, you know, a spring in here. And then he's using a larger shoe tree so it's fully compressed. And then he's prying the gap where the springs are open with the screwdriver and shimming pennies in to expand it. Okay, I think that's the method. So I, I, I replied back and basically saying, hmm, I've definitely got questions about this. I still kind of do. What's the overall goal of like what it is that this guy's trying to trying to uh, accomplish? If I understand, it seems like you're exerting the tension to just push the shoe tree to do like a full, fully extend everything, kind of like stretch it all. Is that right? That's basically what I asked. He replied, "I stole the idea from Bespoke Addict. Bespoke Addict is a an account on Instagram, Facebook, guy that kind of like salvages old bespoke and vintage shoes." But the coin shims is his idea, the commoner. Ultimately, I have changed the size of an entire shoe over time. However, if you want to take the fast route, you put tension on the shoes, then dip them in fluid. And actually, it doesn't matter the order. You know, you're probably better off installing a dry tree into a wet shoe. You can dry them with paper towels. Just do not blow dry them or use artificial heat. 100% agree. Never want to uh, expedite the drying process. You got to let that happen naturally. Otherwise, you're going to uh, put too much stress, heat, uh, bad elements into this leather of the shoe, and it, it won't be a positive result. He followed up again and said, I, I, I put a size 11 tree into a size 9 shoe. That's, that's a pretty healthy accomplishment in and of itself. And then I replied saying, yeah, essentially, it sounds like you are doing the brute force approach, as I call it. Not really something you'd use for a minor fit adjustment, which is like what that video was about. And usually what my conversations about stretching shoes are about. But while it works, it's not really the, you know, ideal result. It's something that if you're stretching a size nine to a size 11, that's a substantial change. I wouldn't recommend that for anyone. But as I take a step back and just absorb it all, share my thoughts on, on everything here there, you know, everybody teach their own, like whatever he wants to stretch shoes and, and he gets enjoyment and, uh, you know, enjoys the process as well as enjoying the result of getting to wear the shoe. Awesome. It doesn't matter to me whether he's stretching it two sizes, one size, three sizes, whatever makes him happy and whatever makes all of you happy. My advice would be that it's not necessarily going to provide a good end result for just like being a comfortable, supportive shoe. Yeah, you can really kind of like push the limits of stretching an upper to any degree. But overall, like there's, you know, the the welt, the the actual like integrity of the construction. And once you kind of exert that tension and that tensile strength beyond a certain point, you're kind of degrading the anatomical benefits of a well-made shoe. Additionally, like this is a very easy way to damage the shoe. And, uh, you know, overall, I feel like you're probably better off, unless you're in it for the process, you're better off just getting a shoe that's much closer to your size and making very minor adjustments. Like I describe and demonstrate in the videos, make minor adjustments so that the shoe fits very well without having to make drastic changes. Taking a look at the next comment here. This is about a short that I made uh, kind of comparing boots very briefly. Obviously, it's a short video. Get it? Uh, it's a short kind of comparing the details of well-made shoes and, and kind of more expensive shoes. This commenter, this member of the community, as we like to say here at Shelvage, uh, but seriously, no, this, this commenter, there are people that make good financial decisions, and then there are people that make bad financial decisions. If I were interested in giving the impression of being wealthy, these would definitely be the shoes I'd go for. However, my interests don't lie in wasteful spending. 
10 years ago, I bought a pair of Chelsea style boots for $90, comfortable, still going strong, and they look great. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know where to start. So there's kind of the preconceived notion that like expensive shoes mean wasteful spending. I would say that's something that belongs to the high fashion area. You know, if you're spending $1,500 on a pair of shoes from a, like a department store, a name brand that is simply that, that price because it's a name brand. Looking at the shoes here and the shoes that, that I talk about, you know, on, on this uh, channel, Throughout this podcast, I think we all know that's not this. Like we're talking about, you know, traditional handmade, well-made, like welted leather footwear, which there's a price point for a reason. There's craftsmanship and, and artisans that are doing this work and putting practical, functional benefits into the footwear that a pair of $90 shoes is never going to have. Now, on the flip side of that, I get people are not going to spend $1,000 on a shoe, nor would I recommend everybody to do that, whether you can afford it or not. Do I fault this guy for having this opinion? No. What I would frame it as is it's a bit uninformed. Uh, he's commenting on footwear that obviously he's not familiar with, and that's all right. $90 style Chelsea boots are great. If he enjoys them and it doesn't hurt his feet to wear, more power to him. We invested in these shoes because not only do we appreciate the craftsmanship and the benefits of traditional leather footwear, but we also understand and have prioritized the value that you get in a shoe of this price. Is it wasteful spending? Maybe in the concept that you could spend that money on something else, but if you have the budget for it, and this is something that is going to be a, an integral part of your wardrobe, you're going to wear them, they fit, they provide you the functional and aesthetic benefit that is of value to you, then it's not wasteful spending. I think it's important to call out for the folks that may not be as initiated into the group as, as the normal listeners and myself, you know, a thousand dollar shoe relatively speaking, is kind of like the entry level of that high-end, you know, bespoke world. So, yes, it's expensive in comparison to kind of the the top of the top. It's not the most expensive, but you're not paying for superficial details. You're paying for form, function, uh, execution, and persistent functional benefits that you will not only see, but feel each and every step that you wear one of these boots. Possibly my favorite part of the podcast, this is going to be the weekly rant. To be honest, I've tried to record this a few times and I can't seem to uh, be happy with like the result of what I've recorded. I ended up with the, a tip of the day or a tip of the week. And what that was actually turning into was a rant. So for the tip of the week, AKA rant part one, it's going to be, if you see yourself in my shoes from, you know, a couple of years ago where I don't really have an established like network, I don't have a lot of connections. And now all of a sudden today I have connections with a number of very well-regarded shoemakers. I can reach out to shoemakers that I don't have any relationship with and build one rather quickly. How do you go about doing that? One of the most obvious things that prevents people from establishing connections online is common sense. When you're communicating with people online, you have to be respectful of them. You can't act like their time and their you know priorities don't exist and just send them random messages like, hey, how much is that shoe? Hey, I want to buy that shoe. Hey, tell me where I can buy this. What's up with that sock? You got to like build a relationship just like if you were to walk into a physical store, if you were to meet someone face to face, you have to interact with them like you respect them. Or you ha like you have mutual respect for them. If you don't, they're not going to really care and they're not really going to give a shit about responding to you. Let's be honest. I have hundreds, if not thousands of unread messages. I would love to respond to them all, but let's be frank. I can't. I can't decipher people's like cryptic messages where they just send me a random DM and say, 
tell me where you got that pair of socks. How many pictures have I posted of socks over the years? And if you just say, tell me where you got that sock, I don't have the time to try and figure out what picture or what reel you saw that made you want to ask what sock that was. You got to put a little bit of effort into it. And this is not just me, but this is just, you know, the most apt example that I can think of. Here's uh, another real life example. Say you see a pair of shoes in a post. Instead of just reaching out to that shoemaker via DM and say, hey, I want to buy that shoe. You need to put a little bit of effort into it. You need to build a relationship with that person. You need to try and stand out and convey that you do care about what it is that they put their blood, sweat, and tears into enough for them to respond to you. There's plenty of people that are sending them DMs all the time, and they cannot tell who's a real customer from who's somebody that's just trying to waste their time. They can't do it. It's impossible. So you need to go above and beyond. And if you're trying to establish that relationship and you're taking that initiative, you have to at least take enough initiative to convince them that you are worth them investing their time and responding back to you. Once they've responded back to you, it's just common sense where you continue to have a conversation, explain what it is that caught your eye, you know, in a couple of weeks, catch up, say, hey, how's everything going? How's the family? You know, what's what's going on? I saw I saw this other post, just curious, you know, I would love to learn more about what it is that you do, how you do it. It's not always going to work, but just like you build relationships in person, if you try and do that same exact thing via the internet, you'll get more positive responses than negative. Now, for what I was originally planning to rant about today in this episode, how to build a quality shoe collection. And honestly, when it when it becomes something like this, even though I don't think of myself as a shoe collector, when you have like over 10 pairs of shoes, you're, you're collecting shoes. It's very easy to fall into the trap of trying to get super creative and just see what, what's the most amazing shoe that I can make or I can order. And that's natural. I've done it. But that result turns out amazingly, except it may not have the longevity that you hope. When you're building a shoe collection, let's just call it like 20 pairs. Some may think that's crazy. Some may think 20 pairs. I have 20 pairs that I wear in a day. Hey, again, to each your own or each our own, to each your own. Who cares? Each of us can do whatever the hell we want, you know? But when building a reasonable collection that you want to uh, last a lifetime, because these are shoes that are meant to last a lifetime, you should do it with intention and you should do it in a way that like you want that shoe to be unique and special for you, but you also want to be able to wear it because if you can't wear it, what's the enjoyment that you're getting out of it? At least personally for me, all of the enjoyment is about the times that I'm able to wear the shoe, not the times that I can stare at it while it's on my shoe rack. With that being said, what I would suggest is make the collection versatile. Make each pair as versatile as you would want the entire collection to be. If you have a whole bunch of very niche shoes where you can only wear it in a very strict circumstance, you're not going to get that much use out of it. Maybe that's great for one pair. Maybe that's great for a few pairs. But if you have a whole collection of very like niched down shoes that like you just can't wear all the time, what's what's the fun? What's the enjoyment that you're getting out of that? Other than just saying like, oh, you know what? I ordered this crazy shoe that nobody else has. A way to do that is don't always go bold. Now, I'm not talking to the folks that want to go bold because obviously like that's what they're comfortable with. But for the majority of us, we need to kind of have more subtle, more calm colors. So it's not all natural edges. It's not all tan, bright red, burgundy shoes. It's got to be some, you know, some, uh, it's got to have some subtle, refined energy to it. The more that you kind of fill up your collection with these bright, bold, exciting Instagram post type shoes, the less you're going to wear them. So if I could leave you with one piece of advice, what I would say is, if we just take a shoe collection of 20 as average and we kind of split it up into thirds, try to have it so that each third can stretch a little bit out of its comfort zone. So if you have your your formal shoes, your kind of mid-range shoes, and then your casual shoes, your cash, some of your casual shoes should be able to be like mid-range, semi-casual, semi-formal. 
Some of the mid-range should be casual and some should be able to flex up to the formal area. And then all of your formal shoes, while some of them may be strictly formal, you should have some flexibility where they can kind of be dressed down a little bit. That creates the most like optimal collection where you can get the most use out of all the shoes, most if not all of the time. I don't have that yet, but that's definitely what I'm aiming for. Keep an eye peeled on the channel. I've got the, uh, the final video of comparing the handmade shoes from Yearn Shoemaker, Helen Shoemaker, and Acme Shoemaker's Marvel line. Uh, I've been working on this for a while. All of the individual unboxings and reviews are out on the channel now. And then this next video is going to be a side-by-side -side comparison of all of them. I think it'll be pretty informative, beneficial, and kind of be, be a staple reference point out there in the community of somebody that's newer to that handmade shoe community that's coming out of China and trying to understand like what the most valuable, what the what the best fit is for them from a you know a price to value proposition. And I, I think this will be kind of that reference article, reference visual that'll inform their decision. I appreciate the guys that are still here lasted this entire video. That's really, really means a lot to me and it's really important to the channel and of course the podcast. Let me know what you enjoyed most about this episode and what you're looking forward to most in next week's episode. As always, leave a comment down below. Put your, put your favorite color in it. That's how I'll know that you lasted until the end of this episode and I'll be able to prioritize getting back to your comments before anybody else's. Make sure that you subscribe. Make sure that you sign up for the Apple podcast, the Spotify podcast, wherever you're you listen to your podcast and I appreciate it again. I will see you next week. Thanks.